I like seeing this world that's sort of in flux with the magic. And it, we hear about dragons, we hear about all kinds of other stuff. And it's even said within the text that like unicorns have kind of fallen to myth. I think that's even a term for it in fantasy literature. It's called thinning. Mm. So it happens in the Lord of the Rings when all the elves go to the West and the magic is also leaving the world and a lot of other authors copied it. I wonder if that ties into, honestly, it's a fairly conservative um, point of view where a lot of people feel like somehow their youth was more pure and more magical and now they see modernity and the world changing in ways that they don't like and so it feels like that magic of youth is starting to go away. Welcome, friends, to episode 230 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm writer Luke Elliott. And I'm filmmaker James Bailey. And this week we discuss Peter S. Beagle's 1968 novel, The Last Unicorn. And joining us this week in the Lilac Forest is Simone Heller. Simone translates and writes fantasy, science fiction, and preferably something in between. Her short fiction has been a finalist for a Hugo Award and the winner of the Yuji Foster Memorial Award. Welcome to the show, Simone. Hi, thank you for having me. So I first met Simone at the Viable Paradise Writers Workshop. Uh, gosh, what year was that? 2018, I want to say? Yeah, yeah. Around then. <laughs> um, and I read your piece, uh, When We Were Starless, which went on to be published in Clark's Word. I think was maybe being published like that week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, that was the first thing I read. Uh, Because we were given, like, homework, I think, that first night to read uh, what we were going to critique the next day. And I read your story, and I was absolutely blown away. Couldn't believe I was being asked to critique it, because I was like, this is so good, I don't know what to say. (laughs) Um, It was amazing, and, uh, yeah, I had to tell you that. And and, uh, I feel like we became friends after that. Absolutely. (laughs) And and I'm so glad to have you on the show. You know, I think you're an awesome writer, and you are... uh, living in Germany, and you work on translations. Uh, So just a very interesting perspective and and definitely one I'm excited to get on this uh, on this novel. I think you both kind of started talking about this project back then, right? So yeah, a little bit later, we went to a convention called Fourth Street Fantasy, I think the following year. Um, And my memory of it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we got a lift back to the airport, I think on the final day together we shared a lift and we we talked about the podcast and i we were just brainstorming like what could i have you on for and i think you suggested the last unicorn um when you found out i had not read it (laughs) yeah very likely um i think you were kind of blown away (laughs) (laughs) and uh yeah that was like uh gosh back in 2019 so i've been i've been saying we're gonna do it one of these days and we've been putting it off putting it off and it felt like the time was right, um, you know, the stars aligned, and we decided to do it. I'm excited about talking about this novel and, and getting into the adaptation, um, but I think the first place I want to start, uh, Simone, is finding out what what is special about this novel to you. What made you What made you suggest this one? So this was one of the first fantasy novels I ever read, and um, I fell immediately in love with its beauty and its. Uh, adventure too. I think um, as a kid, I had a totally different perspective on it. I just read it for sheer adventure and everything that's going on in this world. And I think I still can see that when I read it today. I really like the world and the language. The language got me immediately. That's, I think, the best thing about the book. Absolutely. I was immediately struck by the language. Um, I I have so many thoughts swirling around, um, but I I do want to touch in with you, James. Uh, as the non-writer uh, in the group, um, that's uh, what my that's what my name tag says. Whenever I walk around, <laughs> it's just the non-writer. Yeah, uh, I'm curious. Like, what? Maybe maybe just some general uh, impressions. What did you think of the book reading it for the first time? So yeah, I knew this this story had a reputation, so I kind of brought that into the story, knowing that it was going to be this epic fantasy journey. And I was struck by the fact that it was playing with the form in a way I didn't expect. I thought it was going to be a very traditional fantasy story, and it kind of is in those fantasy adventure elements, quest elements. 
But then there's other there's some stuff to be surprised with. Like you said, the language, it's very beautiful. It evokes like that fairy tale fantasy feel. And then at the same time, there's like a little bit of meta, like engaging with the the m- more modern uh, contemporary reader of the time in, in some of the ways. And, and I just found it to be uh, the comparison came to mind for me because it's my frame of reference. Something I saw before this was and read was The Princess Bride and the way that The Princess Bride is a fantasy story, and, but it plays with the form. It still has those traditional aspects but it's it's giving you something different. It's unique in a way and it's standing out. And there's comedic elements that you might not expect and more contemporary sort of leanings. Yeah, I, I, I think that's all that's all there for me. I, you know, honestly, this this novel was kind of an enigma for me. Um, it's unusual compared to a lot of other things I've read. Um, it, it does feel like a throwback in many ways to some of the oldest fantasy. I, I, I read um, Lud in the Mist. And um, I think it's called The King of Elfland's Daughter. I was in a class talking about like really classic fantasy. And, and we covered some of these like older novels. And it feels to me like Beagle is writing in that sort of mode, um, trying to evoke old fairy tales. Um, and it's interesting that this came out in 68. So it was a- it was like after Tolkien, but around the time where The Lord of the Rings was becoming very popular in the States. Um, and I read somewhere that people think that that helped build uh, popularity of this book when it came out. Um, I, I did not realize he was an American author too until I got into the um, into his bio um, because I thought I thought he was like must be British or something for some reason I don't know but um, no he's not he's an American so uh, I guess just general thoughts Simone you you hinted at maybe it being slightly different for you now than it was reading it as a kid. And I think that's interesting, right? Because as as authors, we train ourselves to read things differently, I think, uh, as we're trying to analyze the craft behind it. And I'm wondering if that was affecting your reading of it this time. And just in general, what was it like reading it this time? So partially, I think, yes, it's the writer's angle of seeing what makes this story work and what makes uh, the chapters flow and everything. But even I think uh, if I were not a writer as an adult, I would have had a different reading experience because as a kid, I could simply um, ignore all the meta elements of the story and the almost postmodern sensibility, the in-jokes with the reader. I simply didn't notice them. They were boring for me probably and I just focused on the quest (laughs) story. (laughs) I'm still not sure if it's the core of the novel, but I think it is somehow. That that sort of meta commentary he's making you're saying is the core or of the at novel? least the relationship between the meta commentary and the actual story the way how the tropes are subverted and every every legend is somehow broken or yeah so so for me this novel like it, it, it succeeds on a few levels and then there are a few levels where i was struggling with it to be quite honest so so the prose is absolutely gorgeous like you can read any passage in this novel and find a quote that is worth you know like writing down in your in your book of favorite quotes and in fact i added some to my goodreads list um because there's just a lot of great writing in here um there is i think the most number of uh similes per paragraph or per page that i've ever encountered in maybe any writing there's so many similes. Um, just this thing is like this thing over and over and over again. But they're they're delightful. Like he continues to surprise with them and find just comparisons that I would have never expected um, in, in general with, with the figurative language. So the reading itself is a delight. Um, and then the story is this interesting play with what a fairy tale even is. Um It's unusual in the sense that I didn't feel like I was truly in a secondary world, as in like a a Lord of the Rings, where you're in this um, truly separate world. Because every now and then we'd get like a a phrase or a comparison to something in our world. So to me, this felt like it is positioned to be within our world. Like this is some sort of fairy tale or legend that exists in our reality. Um, and that opens the door to the nature of magic. And I think a lot of this book is about the nature of magic and reality and seemingly making a comment about how we are forgetting or becoming unable to recognize magic 
And it seems like that was a theme with the unicorns and being the last unicorn. And, you know, she goes out into the world and people can't even recognize her for what she is. Uh, so he's making all these commentaries about, I think, our modern society. And, and a lot of that is working great for me. Um, it, just something about the old fashioned style of storytelling. Um, and it is very um, whimsical and it sort of just bobs along for a while. And I wasn't really sure what what like the <laughs> what the adventure really was. I, I recognize she was trying to find out what happened to the unicorns. But other than that, it's just it kind of goes in some strange places. And um, I don't know, it, it, I, I found some difficulty getting truly invested in the tale. And, and maybe that is partly because it is I think it is written for a younger audience. Um but whenever whenever I could find myself getting lost in it, that was when it was always at its best. And, and I was able to really connect with it. You kind of mentioned something that, that I don't even know that it's true, but I sort of built up in my mind. It felt like a story where Beagle was writing it for, I don't even know if they, he has children, but was writing it for like his children and then wanted to have fun with it as a writer was like here's a here's a children's tale or seemingly a ch- children's tale and i'm going to play with these elements and make it really fun on a on a writing level or for people who who enjoy that sort of extra layer and you were talking about the use of simile and i think as a kid i love i i still love simile but as a kid i think i really engaged to simile a lot and you know maybe that has something to do with the, just the sheer amount that's in there i think it's a great thing for a kid to read because it can show you how to play with language and i can i can imagine a young simone reading this and 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 thinking like this is amazing you can play with language in such a creative way um do you think that that helped was that part of what made you fall in love with it as a kid i think so yeah because i've always had this like i like poetry and Mm -hmm. uh songs most most of all so it's like this language it really sings to me and that's something i don't know i think i even sometimes inadvertently um copy the tone of that of some of this because it's so such a big influence yeah and you're not alone um i i've heard uh patrick rothfuss in particular is is famous for saying this is like the best novel he ever read that's on the front of my book yeah it's on the front of mine (laughs) as well um and i read the slow regard of silent things by him and that to me is the the di- there's a direct lineage between the two. <laughs> I, I'm like, okay, that's his like riff on the last unicorn because it, it the language in that is so reminiscent of this. Now that I've read it, and I didn't recognize it at the time, but now that I see it, I'm like, oh, he was he was really playing with this sort of language, and uh, and honestly, even the character in that um, is very similar to the unicorn in the in this. Um, and then even beyond that, I think his his uh, his series in general, we can see some connective tissue. So if James, we ever get to uh, King Killer Chronicles, which we're hoping the adaptation will actually be made, that's something we can pay attention to is looking for last unicorn connections because I think it was very influential on him as a writer. Um, even some of the meta commentary, like they're, like the way that he engages with the nature of storytelling, and that's something that is present here. So, um, and I'm sure he's not alone. Other authors, other fantasy authors out there, definitely influenced by Beagle. So he's a big name in fantasy, and I had never, I had never read him before. So I'm, I'm really glad that I got to. Yeah, and that that King Killer Chronicles uh, adaptation is not looking super promising right now at the current moment, but we'll see. You know, I, I it's, uh, it just sounds like they've kind of stalled right now. I wanted to ask with the the time period that this book came out, The Last Unicorn. Do you feel that this is like a direct uh, response to something like a Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit? Or was he not really in conversation in that way? I feel like at this time in fantasy, there was a lot more experimentation because the tropes weren't so set. I think always that <clears throat> later when, for example, the Terry Brooks, the Shannara series came out, then it was like uh, coined into something that's always replicating the same uh, quests and always uh, copying of each other. And I think this is not a copy of a copy, if that makes any sense. This is when it was still original ideas where people were trying out what works in fantasy and what doesn't and what kind of frame the whole genre has. Because I think today you also wouldn't have, or you wouldn't have a very commercial novel where you, the where it's not the real secondary world, but these glimpses of our world come up all the time. 
it does feel very unique. And I, I was thinking about that too. Like in the 60s, I wonder how original it was for to have the creature a, a mythical creature be the main character not a, not a human not something that that people are used to identifying with in in storytelling and fantasy but to have like a creature i know they've gone on to make you know dragons or the main characters and things like that in plenty of books but i i wonder where how cutting edge this was yeah i think i think it probably was i mean it's also a girl is the protagonist you know which is probably still somewhat unusual for the time period Simone was talking about the the way fantasy sort of crystallized around that, especially high fantasy, right? Like that 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 Tolkien style, and it is interesting to read this because it it, it is using a lot of similar myths and legends, right? Like you have harpies and you have dragons and you have wizards and you have a lot of the similar things, yet it it feels almost independent of Lord of the Rings to me. It feels like it's going back to more of where Tolkien was inspired. Um, so it, I, what, I, I mean, maybe he did read it. He probably did. But to me, this feels like it was, it was written more as a throwback to um, some of those other uh, novels I mentioned earlier, like uh, King of Elfland's Daughter, um, where it is more about like the, the, the history and tradition of, of fairy tale. I'm not an expert in this sort of thing, but that's what I was getting from it. Um, so one thing I want to touch on before we get into uh, into Peter S. Beagle as a as a person as a writer, um, you told me that you read this novel in German, um, and and uh, you were unable to find I think like an ebook version of it, which we'll get into. I have some theories about why that might be the case right now um, from reading about some stuff with him. But um, what was it like reading it in German? And and that's something you do, you work a lot with is doing translations for. Uh, I think you, you said you do a lot of English to German translations. Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. I mostly translate uh, fantasy and science fiction and licensing books. So that's exactly my line of work, uh, of everyday work I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a private reader, I very rarely read translations now because <laughs> it's not... <laughs> It's, yeah, it's not what I do. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it was interesting to dive into a translation again. It's a very old one. So um, I want to say it came out in the 80s. I'm not 100% sure. Let's see. Yeah, it says 1983. Um, so it's a little bit old fashioned in terms of language, but otherwise it's a very good translation, I think. But still, uh, there are some things I noticed about it. That were super interesting. So, um, for example, is the unicorn in the English version always a she or sometimes also it? I think always a she. So I think so too. But in the in German, you have this very gendered language. So unicorn mm. is a word can only be neutral. It's it all the time. Um, <clears throat> so in some sentences in the translation, it's still it because they can't make the sentence go well without with saying she. You can't combine unicorn and she in a very good way. Hmm. Does that change how you see the character in a way, or do you feel that it is still she? I think they got out of their way, or the translator got out of the of um, his way to um, reform the sentences a little bit so that it doesn't come together so often, so that he can still use she as a pronoun for the unicorn. But it it needs a few changes to make that work, and so it also makes a point to make her a she. Um, but uh, in some places it was unavoidable to call the unicorn it, and it's a little bit strange, So, especially because oh. it, they made such a point of it. But that's the problem of translating into a gendered language from a, <clears throat> from a language that has more options to stay neutral like English. Being a translator yourself, I'm curious, like when you have to make those decisions to, to try to stay as faithful as you can to the original source, how how do you justify that for yourself when you're changing the language in ways like it does it does it feel natural or does it feel like you're you're doing something you're not supposed to sometimes <laughs> sometimes you um well you always have to turn in something at the end of the day you need to write something so sometimes i just have uh, um, a dilemma and i can only go in one bad direction or in another bad direction and then i need to make a decision sometimes i ask the authors if i really don't know what to do and they also mostly don't know but at least I have their <laughs> opinion on it you know um, and sometimes it's also you find a good solution it's an, something natural that's not that's not the same but something equivalent or you can do something equivalent in another place 
of the novel. So it's more like really you need to feel if you're doing it right. I have another tra translation question, mm -hmm. and I hope this is interesting to our listeners. I find it fascinating. <laughs> um, and, and so I feel like what we're talking about is a little more nuts and bolts, like the, the, the differences in gendered language and, and how that comes together. But my, my question is maybe a little more artistic in the sense that you're reading something like if you were translating something like this novel, and we've talked about how beautiful the prose is and how there's a poetry to the language itself, which often comes down to the way English words sound together. And when it comes time to translate that into German, I imagine there are times where the sound and the feel is just different in a different language. And how do you decide when to follow the spirit of the meaning, I guess, uh, versus the artistry and the poetry of the language? And, and how do you make those decisions uh, when you're trying to maintain some sort of like quality of the prose? Yeah, it's, if it's a good book with good language, it's all the time. It's a struggle all the time because, for example, German is much more cumbersome in, the, in some ways. You can't, you can't go for a very sleek style or a very um, say a lot in, in a few words. That's not possible. You always got some phrases that run into each other and stuff. And um, then you have to just, for example, make three sentences where there was one in the original. And at one point you will have to cut something because it's like one third longer in the German version, the whole novel. That mm. always happens. So you need to really, uh, it, could, it can be one third longer, so that's not a problem. But sometimes the sentences to have the same melody, they need to be shorter or just more varied or something. So it's really, yeah, you're struggling all the time and I feel you're bound to fail it's always failing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why you bring in a talented uh, author, I think, to make these decisions. That way you have that artistic point of view that you can approach it with, whereas somebody who maybe is looking for a, a more direct translation standpoint wouldn't understand maybe the artistry going on as well. So I, that, I think that probably makes you a great translator, especially for, for fiction. There's, there's even a whole genre of like Amazon or Goodread, a Goodreads um, reviews that are... Um, yeah, trashing translations because they just compare sentence to sentence at some point and then they see, oh, it's different. <laughs> you can't have that. Luke and I are just coming off of um, 2001 A Space Odyssey and there's an AI in there. And I know there's a lot of people who will just take blocks of text and put them into a translation software. And just thinking about something like that happening, like really grinds my gears because it's like you're not going to be able to execute on like the vision of the of the author if you're just direct translating for, through a computer or something like that that can't understand the art history. <laughs> It's coming up now. There are already translators offering like a machine translated text. They just edit. <clears throat> and I think wow. that's at the moment, if they don't get better, it's beyond the point because you, if, if the, your first draft is already lacking the artistic vision. So literary translators need to be artists. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we got to move on from the translation as much as I would love to continue talking about that. Um, if, but if any other points come up about the difference in the version you were reading, feel free to feel free to introduce them. I will. So uh, we're going to get into the bio now for Peter S. Beagle, um, because I think it's interesting to talk about the writer. Um, he is a fantasy novelist and, uh, and American author. He was born in 1939 in Manhattan. He would, uh, I'm, I'm going to fast forward a little bit to when he went to school. So he garnered early recognition from the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards, winning a scholarship to the University of Pittsburgh for a poem he submitted as a high school senior. He went on to graduate from the university with a degree in creative writing. Following a year overseas, Beagle held the graduate Stegner Fellowship in Creative Writing at Stanford University, where he overlapped with Ken Kesey, another author we have covered on our podcast uh, of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest fame. Beagle wrote his first novel, A Fine and Private Place, when he was only 19 years old. Uh, he followed it with a memoir, I See by My Outfit, in 1965. Today, he is best known as the author of The Last Unicorn, uh, as well as later fantasies following The Folk of the Air. In the 1970s, Beagle turned to screenwriting. After writing an introduction to the American print edition of The Lord of the Rings, he co-wrote the screenplay for the 1978 Ralph Bakshi animated version of The Lord of the Rings which we have covered as, a, I think, a bonus episode for our Patreon, which is out on the main feed now. 
where we covered the Bakshi version, um, which I don't think either of us were big fans of, but we recognize this is an important piece of fantasy sort of history. Well, it used that rotoscope technology that was kind of rudimentary at the time, and it, yeah. it came out weird. It was different, and, and, and it is an important piece, and, and Bakshi definitely had a very different v- vision for how he wanted this thing to look. But it's interesting to note that Beagle wrote the screenplay for that version. And a fascinating connection there, because, you know, Rankin-Bass and... Bakshi, Ralph Bakshi, like w- created some of the Lord of the Rings animated, mm-hmm. and then obviously this this novel that we're talking about would go on to be animated by by Rankin Bass, and so there's like that Ralph Bakshi Rankin Bass connection through Peter S. Beagle. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean it connects to all these things we've covered. Two decades later, he would write the teleplay for the episode Sarek which is episode 71 of Star Trek The Next Generation, which apparently is a fan favorite. I, I can't remember the specific episode. I don't know if either of you know your Star Trek episodes that well, <laughs> but apparently it's, it is a fan favorite. In 2005, Beagle would publish a coda to The Last Unicorn, a novelette entitled Two Hearts, and he began to work on a full novel sequel. Two Hearts would go on to win uh, the Hugo Award for Best Novelette in 2006 and a Parallel Nebula Award in 2007. Uh, which is cool. Also noteworthy that uh, your novelette, When We Were Starless, was up for a Hugo as well. So I thought that was an interesting little connection here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, apparently it was, it was quite popular, and that was as recent as 2006. So at, when it comes to writing this book, uh, it, he said that it took him close to two years to write The Last Unicorn, and he said it was hard every step of the way. He came up with the idea for the novel in 1962 while on an art, artistic retreat in Berkshire Hills after Viking Press rejected his novel The Mirror Kingdom. He stated that though the idea for the novel was, quote, just suddenly there, he also said that he had read tons of fantasy and mythology from childhood, and that his mother told him that he had shared a story about unicorns during a visit to an elementary school class that she taught. He also mentioned that he loved the book The Cult from the Mountain, by Dorothy Lathrop as a child, and that Spanish artist Marcio Rodriguez had given him a painting of unicorns fighting bulls when he was 17, which that seems very uh, influential. <laughs> and uh, he, he then went on to write an 85-page manuscript, which differs greatly from the current version of the book. Though the unicorn is much the same, the story is set in modern times, and the unicorn is accompanied by a two-headed demon named Webster and Azazel, The original version was published as a limited edition hardcover by Subterranean Press titled The Last Unicorn, The Lost Version in 2006. So that's interesting. (laughs) Um, He did say that he stopped working on that manuscript in 1963, saying it was a dead end. So uh, he wrote this other version set in modern times with a two-headed demon, 85 pages, ended up abandoning it and writing the version we have read. But I think it's interesting that it went on to be published with Subterranean Press. Uh, I don't know if I'd be comfortable with something like that. I, I just throw that burn that thing. I don't want. I don't want to ever see it again. Um, but apparently he was okay with it. It seems. <laughs> well, and very notable too because he said it in the modern day. Yeah. And this book clearly has some connections to, like there there are references to things that could only be seen from our world and from that that modern perspective. So. To, to, you know, get rid of that element and still have some of the lingering sort of aspects is, is very fascinating. I'd be interested to read that. That's a good point. I, I always wondered if that is like a leftover fragment of that original version or if he I mean, I assume he truly intended to have every little modern reference that he had in there. But I don't know. Part of me wonders if some of it was an accident. <laughs> he just like a, he just loved a particular phrase from the original version and decided to keep it. I could see it going either way, honestly. It feels really ahead of its time, like I said. You know what else it reminds me of is um, A Knight's Tale. You know how they have like all the all the modern music in, in A Knight's yeah. Tale? It's in, not like, that medieval... extreme. <laughs> this is much more subtle than that, but yeah. that, that sort of play with fantasy, like maybe, maybe A Knight's Tale and Princess Bride and other stories like that that play with fantasy and modern mm-hmm. context owe a lot to The Last Unicorn. You know, and I, I've seen this in other places accidentally, I believe. You know, it, it, so it's funny how this can happen sometimes. Um, and, and in here, there was like, a, there was one specific reference to like a, a catching the A-train somewhere, um, which felt very modern. Um, and then, of course, there's, uh, we get it, we get a moment where Robin Hood is referenced. And I'm like, wait a minute. So this is a world where Robin Hood exists, you know, so, so that kind of changes my perspective on it, too. Um, anyway, we'll get into more of that 
I do want to get into, he had some unfortunate disputes with uh, his former manager, Connor Cochran. In July of 2019, in a 17-page decision, Alameda County Superior Court Judge Michael Markman found Cochran liable for financial elder abuse, fraud, and breach of fiduciary duty and awarded Beagle $325,000 as well as an additional $7,500 for defamation and an undetermined amount in attorney's fees. Cochran declared bankruptcy 16 hours before the trial was due to begin. Beagle was unable to collect the money that Cochran owned, and the rights to Beagle's work were left in legal limbo. Then, in February of 2021, after a six-year battle in bankruptcy and California state courts, Beagle was able to regain the rights to his intellectual property. So, he only got his rights back to his IP this last year. I referenced it earlier. I think that's why like I went to go listen to the audiobook and it doesn't it doesn't seem to exist. Although there is a version of the audiobook where Beagle is reading it himself. And I was able to listen to parts of it on YouTube that people had uploaded. I don't know if legally or not, but um and I was like this is a great recording. This is awesome. But it does it's not on Audible. It doesn't seem available for purchase. And you were having similar problems with the with the uh, ebook. I think they're in the process of sort of remaking all of this stuff so that they can have full control over it because these previous versions probably have some legal um, strings attached to them that still goes back to this former manager. That's my guess. I even wanted to get some of those um, um, recordings back then. I think they were it's what was called Conlan Press. Um, and uh, they were never delivered, so people paid money, including me. Yay! <laughs> oh, and they <laughs> and never arrived. No, no, no. They, I don't know if they were ever made. So it was just one delay after the other for years and years and years. So you could see this getting going wrong from a very um, early point, actually. Yeah. So I'm sure there are a lot more details to this that um, I don't know. Uh, is this something? It sounds like maybe you've been following it, Simone. Is there is there anything I, I missed or, or should add to this? Uh, I think there was some minor kerfuffle somewhere on Twitter or something when the legal battle um, came up and everything. Maybe even some CIFWA um, notice or something because um, of the publisher. Yeah, I do remember reading some of that. Um, but I think it's time now to move on into the actual book itself. I just wanted to give that taste of him. He's still he's still alive, still writing, and we're all glad that he has control of his IP back. Um, and uh, it is unfortunate that apparently it, he had to go through so much bullshit. Honestly, it sounds like to to get to get that back, and and he got taken advantage of. It sounds like, which you know, as an author, we never want to hear about. I see what you did with there with like the bull in the story and the bullshit, <laughs> a red bullshit. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to read a opening paragraph of summary for the novel, and then we can talk about specifics, things that st- jumped out to us, uh, things that we liked. So, a group of hunters pass through a forest in search of game. They believe they are passing through a unicorn forest where animals are kept safe by a magical aura. Before they leave, one of the hunters calls out a warning to the unicorn that she may be the last of her kind. This revelation disturbs the unicorn, and eventual doubt and worry drive her to leave her forest. She travels through the land and discovers that humans no longer recognize her. Instead, they see a pretty white mare. She encounters a talking butterfly who speaks in riddles and songs. Eventually, the butterfly warns her that her kind has been herded to a faraway land by a creature known as the Red Bull. During her journey, the unicorn is taken captive by a traveling carnival, led by the witch Mami Fortuna who uses magical spells to create the illusion that regular animals are creatures of myth. The unicorn is the only true legendary creature among the group, save for the harpy Selino Schmendrick, a magician traveling with the carnival, sees the unicorn for what she is, and he frees her. The unicorn frees the other creatures, including Selino, who kills Mami Fortuna and Rook, her assistant. All right, let's stop there. We got the introduction of the unicorn and the capture in the, uh, I think it was called the Night Carnival? Midnight, midnight Carnival. Midnight Carnival. What was your initial take and, and, your, and your, your thoughts surrounding this? Let's start with Simone. Like, what, what was your thoughts reading this part? Yeah, I think it's a classical setup of a quest. Um, in this classical view, I found interesting that at the point where our hero would get a mentor, and it's usually like an old mentor or something it's here this butterfly because i think an immortal (laughs) being of 
endless age doesn't need an older mentor. It's just this um, creature that is forgetting everything immediately and not very focused or something. That's something I found super interesting. It was funny. Yeah. There's like a, there's nice little moments of humor uh, in there where and, and he is subverting, I think, a lot of those tropes that we expect. Um, it's interesting, though, because Schmendrick is immortal, we find out later. And so it, it kind of ties into potentially that mentor. But he's also like bumbling and he can't cast like he doesn't actually do any magic. And so he's a ve- he's also very subversive to these tropes. Right. Like he's not this powerful mentor that you want to learn from. And in fact, he seems like. He had a powerful mentor once who was like ashamed of him and kicked him out. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of the story is something you mentioned earlier, Luke, the way that it feels like the magic is falling away a little bit from this world. And I always find that interesting, it, depending on where you set up your fantasy story, like Game of Thrones, for example, or A Song of Ice and Fire is is set up in this world that's like kind of post all the crazy magic stuff and like maybe magic's coming back into the world. And and here we have a world where this unicorn, if that hunter doesn't call out just in sort of like a, we can't find any hunt, so there must be a unicorn here. And the guy with him is like, what are you talking about? Like, you've never seen a unicorn before. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> exactly. And so if the unicorn never hears this, the unicorn never really questions because her life is great. She's, you know, she's protecting, she's doing what she's supposed to within the forest. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And then she gets this little bit of doubt. That's like that seed that starts to grow. And that's what sends us on our quest. So I like seeing this world that's sort of in flux with the magic. And we hear about dragons, we hear about all kinds of other stuff. And it's even said within the text that like unicorns have kind of fallen to myth. I think that's even a term for it in fantasy literature. It's called thinning. Hmm. So it happens in the Lord of the Rings when all the elves go to the West and the magic is also leaving the world and a lot of other authors copied it. I wonder if that ties into, honestly, it's a fairly conservative um, point of view where a lot of people feel like somehow their youth was more pure and more magical and now they see modernity and the world changing in ways that they don't like. And so it feels like that magic of youth is starting to go away. I think that was something we read like a Michael Moorcock essay about Tolkien. And this was one of his critiques of Tolkien, I think, was about this this sort of uh, fairly conservative uh, social view of the world. Um, and I wonder if, if that is responsible for that thinning trope or at least tied to it in some way. It could be. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> because it, it, it's like, where's the chicken? Where's the egg in the situation? Like, who who started this trend of the thinning sort of magical system? I'm not sure. Yeah. But, you know, it, they could definitely be influenced by the same things or in conversation with each other. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, you know, and you were talking about, like, almost like fantasy theory. And one thing that I, when I was at Seton Hill, and we, t- and we were like studying fantasy in that class in particular, we were talking about the different kinds of fantasy. I think this is an author, I want to say Mendelssohn. I'm not sure. I, I wish I was mm-hmm. better at pulling specific names. Fer- Farrah Mendelssohn? <laughs> it might be. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and they outlined the different kinds of fantasy there mm-hmm. are. That's her. And there is uh, portal fantasy. Um, I think a secondary world fantasy, there might be a different name for it. Um, and then liminal fantasy was another one. And I think this would probably fit into liminal fantasy, but it is, um, I I don't think it very neatly fits into any of those three categories. Um, and that's interesting to me, right? Because as soon as you find that there are three categories that supposedly all fantasy falls into, and then you find one that doesn't really fit, um, and maybe she would argue this is this is a liminal fantasy, and and uh, but I don't know. To me, like I guess maybe my understanding of liminal fantasy is m- more to do with like magic and stuff coming into our world and beginning to uh, seep into it in ways, and and this is like a little different than that too. What would contemporary like magical world in like an urban environment be considered liminal? I think liminal, yeah. That's like where 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 fantasy is either present or or seeping into the world more and becoming more present. Um, that's like your classic. I think urban fantasy is like one of the prime examples of the the, the kind of liminal fantasy. If I'm remembering correctly, this was years ago um, that I actually read this stuff. And then portal fantasy, yeah, you go through a portal and you're in the world. You know, this like a uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, Harry Potter. Uh, there's a lot where you, you go through some sort of portal and you arrive at a, a sort of a fantasy place and all of a sudden you are a fairly modern person who has modern sensibilities, but you're being introduced to a fantasy world. And then you have secondary world fantasy where you are familiar with it, right? Like it's not new to you. This is, this is just how the world is. And like, I, I, like all of these three, n- none of them really neatly fit this story. 
I think it's almost secondary, but then there's the the interesting caveat of all the, you know, modern sensibilities and references. Yeah, I don't know. Again, that's maybe a fairly in, from interesting from a purely academic standpoint, but I found myself thinking about it. Um, let's talk about the carnival itself, right? Like you have Mommy Fortuna and she is this witch who um, has taken a bunch of regular animals and uh, through some sort of illusion magic is making them seem like they are mythical creatures. And she's only captured two actual like legendary creatures. And that is the unicorn and the harpy. And they're kind of set up to be like very similar to one another, but also like polar opposites. Like and the harpy seems to be like evil and, and uh, sort of murderous. Um, but yet is, is tied to the unicorn in, in a lot of interesting ways. Um, and then I think there also is something being said about how her whole show is, a, is, a, is mostly fake and like people, people think they're seeing like Cerberus and instead they're seeing just like a dog. Um, but it's been, it's been made up to look like Cerberus through this magic. Um, there's a, there's a spider that is like weaving these amazing tapestries and like, I forget what it's even described. Like different it, things, even there were two different tapestries in it and. They were looking like something else, something really big, right? Yeah, and but it was funny because the, the the spider like loved what it was doing. It was like the only creature that was sad when it got freed. Like, and I think we hear like a spider crying or something at the end of a chapter, like the dry sound of a spider crying, which is just like such an interesting <laughs> turn of phrase. Um, but yeah, they, so so this is where we meet Schmendrick, who's working with with this woman, and then um, he frees the unicorn who has been trapped in this iron cage. Um, and then when she gets free, she frees all the other animals. And then the harpy kills mommy Fortuna, kills the assistant. Um, and it's some of the like more violent stuff that happens, I guess, in this book. Um, and this, yeah. What, what is the, what is the purpose of this in, in this, in this quest? I mean, we, that is the way that she meets Schmendrick, I guess. The most interesting part about this section to me is again some of the meta stuff that's going on. One one line that stands out is she talks about she's in show business or something like that. And then I'm like, okay, so what commentary is he making on the smoke and mirrors, the illusion of filmmaking or of, you know, Hollywood or whatever whatever commentary he had on show, whether that's theater or, or film or whatever. I found it interesting that it's all a performance and the way the lengths they would go to, what they were able to achieve was magical to the audience but not truly magical in the sense of the quest and the story. So I was having a lot of fun with that part of it. I thought it was also notable that Mommy Fortuna is the final reveal. There's like a tour that they go through and they see all the different creatures. And then in the, in the final cage, I guess, it's Mommy Fortuna and she represents old age. Um, and like the Norse, the-, the Norse goddess of old age, I think. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of Norse stuff in particular. They talk about the, um, they talk about the world serpent. At one point. Yeah, that's also in the circus, right? Or the carnival. So, yeah, the, again, that's another thing that you're like, oh, well, I guess that exists in this world. Um, but then, yeah, so she represents old age. And I wanted to talk about, I think there is a message and a theme behind this book that I wanted to try and unpack with you two because I wasn't quite sure what exactly he's saying. But it's about immortality versus mortality, Right. And you have an immortal creature like the unicorn. You have Schmendrick, who is immortal, but wants to be mortal so that he can get magic back. Like He can't use his magic as long as he's immortal, it feels like. I think he even says that explicitly. And yet the, the unicorn is like saddened by becoming mortal. I'm getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But then like um, feels like she she wants to be immortal because she wants to be a unicorn. So I don't know, like the nature of mortality and immortality, I think is, is, is something that keeps coming up and again and again. And, and we see it here with Mommy Fortuna, like literally portraying the idea of old age and it terrifies everybody. They all run away whenever this part happens in the carnival. Um, so what, what was your take, Simone, on, on what Beagle is getting at with the whole immortality, mortality thing? Do you have any thoughts on that? Mm-hmm. I was thinking about that too. And um, I think what you can see is, immortality makes you detached somehow because that's the main feature of the unicorn being a little bit arrogant and very detached especially from humans and from mortals and I think Schmendrick is like this too he's a little bit mostly caring for himself 
uh, when he's still uh, immortal. And the third character, this is also running ahead already, it's, it's Haggard, because he's not described as an immortal, but I think he has the features. He's like this frozen in time character who maybe represents the bad side of old age or immortality, like no joys and... It brought to mind like the sort of Dr. Manhattan situation from, from Watchmen, right? It's like when you when you become immortal, do you are you will you still be able to put yourself in the perspective of an actual human or are you going to be so, like so distracted by the rest of what immortality brings? Somewhere at this point in the book, I, I wrote down that uh, the the writing is so beautiful in this book and profound at times that I felt like it was reaching through the pages and grabbing me by the heart. And that can be kind of frightening. Um, and, and in fact, it made me feel vulnerable at times. And um, I love that. Like, it's, it's, it's thrilling. It speaks to, like, some sort of truth to the universe. And some of the best writing is when that happens. And so even though, I, you know, I, I, at times I, I'm going to be critical of the book and there are things that I didn't love, like, that, those moments are, are beautiful and, and are powerful. So, I, I, you know, I wanted to highlight that for people who are maybe considering, do I want to read this book? I've seen this movie, perhaps, and listening to this episode about the book. Um, I assume the movie will have some of this. You know, we'll talk about it next week. But if you want to get the actual prose that we're talking about here that is this gorgeous, you have to, you have to read the book. We're talking about the immor- immortality stuff, and I wrote down a quote that really struck me. Like, you were talking about it affecting you making you feel vulnerable. There's a line in here that really made me confront my mortality a little bit. And it's when the immortal becomes mortal, this unicorn. And she says, like, this body is dying. I can feel it rotting all around me. How can anything that is going to die be truly beautiful? And like how that that shift in in what it would be like to go from immortal to mortal. And, and then also just like, yeah, it's pretty evocative that this body is always dying mm. and rotting around us. Like it's, you know, it's a scary thing to think about. Yeah. And I think as humans and, and as mortals, we think about that a lot, right? Like our su- surviving and how long can we live? How can we be healthier and live longer? And and uh, yeah, and we I think people like yearn for this immortality. Oh, if I could only live forever. But the curse of living forever, we've seen it in every story is is you know, watching everyone you love pass and, and, you know, becoming lost in this, in this life all alone. And it seems like the, the the unicorn represents a way, like a path. And in order to be truly happy, you kind of have to just exist in your own little forest where you don't know or care about what else is going on because you're just always going and you don't even experience the feeling of regret or loss. Um, and introducing that to her is almost a curse. Um, which There is like a sadness, I think, throughout this. As much as there is humor and there is sort of a whimsy, there is also this sadness. And it's interesting the way he balances all of those emotions. I think it's time to get into the second paragraph of summary here. We've already touched on some things that happen, so let's, let's go ahead and dive into it. The Unicorn and Schmendrick continue traveling together in an attempt to reach the castle of King Haggard, where the Red Bull resides. When Schmendrick is captured by bandits, the unicorn comes to his rescue and attracts the attention of Molly Gru, the bandit leader's wife. Together, the three continue their journey and arrive at Hagsgate, a town under Haggard's rule and the first one he had conquered when he claimed his kingdom. A resident of Hagsgate named Dren informs them of a curse that stated that their town would continue to share in Haggard's fortune until such a time that someone from Hagsgate would bring Haggard's castle down. Dren goes on to claim that he discovered a baby boy in the town's marketplace one night in winter. He knew that the child was one that the prophecy spoke of, but he left the baby where he found it, not wanting the prophecy to come true. King Haggard found the baby and adopted it. They then leave Hagsgate, but are attacked by the Red Bull. The unicorn runs, but is unable to escape. To aid her, Schmendrick unwittingly turns the unicorn into a human woman. Confused by the change, the Red Bull gives up the pursuit and disappears. The change is has disastrous consequences on the unicorn, who suffers tremendous shock at the sudden feeling of mortality in her human body. Schmendrick tells the unicorn that he is immortal, and that he cannot make real magic unless he is mortal, and encourages her to continue her quest. Okay, so I want to stop here because I feel like this is a, a big moment in the story. Um, first off, we get we get the arrival and the the Hagsgate stuff, which honestly is one of the parts of the book where I found myself having like struggling to 
to stay invested. Um, I was like ready for the Red Bull stuff to really start, and we hadn't gotten there yet. And we were talking about this town. And I just, Molly grew was like kind of interesting, but it kind of felt like a like a distraction. And so we just got like a series of things happening in a row here. Where I was just like, okay, this is this is all right. But I'm like, I was getting, I don't know, a little distracted and f- struggling to stay with the novel. Um, but when we got the Red Bull confrontation, that's where I finally kind of got back into it. And then when she gets transformed into a, a human girl, <laughs> um, I was not expecting that. I, I assume this is a famous part of the story. I thought we were just going to have a unicorn the whole time. I had no idea this was coming. Yeah, I have a couple of things to react to here as well. The... For one, if you're going to name your energy drink company Red Bull, you have to know <laughs> the association to the last unicorn, right? I wonder if that's if that's a thing. I didn't look into it, but I'm curious if there was because yeah. I kept expecting a line to be like, and the Red Bull gave you wings. Gives you wings. <laughs> exactly. I thought that was coming. I should have had a Red um, Bull to drink. Maybe for next next recording, I'll have one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then just the naming, some of the naming of these characters, like Schmendrick has yeah. got to be one of the most, the, the craziest names I've ever Apparently heard. Apparently, it's it's like a Yiddish term, is what I was reading. And so another, it's another one of those things that kind of breaks the, the world a little bit. Um, I forget what, it's for like a bumbling person or something. And that, that made me feel like it was one of those children's tales characters, right? Mm-hmm. Like something that... A, a child would find really fa- like what? That's a weird it's word. It's kind of goofy and, sounding. It, it evokes right. the character for sure. Can it? Can we talk about Schmendrick? I I was thinking yeah. he he must be an artist or a writer. I mean, from the way <laughs> he's he's uh, described uh, with all his identity crises, every everybody gives him a wrong name all the time, and then uh, sometimes he achieves achieves something really great. And the self-doubt immediately creeps back into him. Yeah. He gets arrogant for a short time and then is on, on the floor again. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I love the idea that that Beagle was working through some of his own <laughs> thoughts about being an artist. Um, because, yeah, I mean, he doesn't have real magic, right? Like, in, in, and every now and then he pulls something off and then immediately starts to starts to wonder if it if he's like a real magician. He has that imposter syndrome, it seems like, throughout Um, which, uh, you know, as writers, I think we all we all feel at times. Um, Yeah. I mean, honestly, I felt it reading your story at VP. I thought, like, how did I get into this workshop of someone like this is here? Uh, (laughs) I felt it afterwards when I wanted to write something again. (laughs) (laughs) And that's the thing, right? Like we all feel it in ways at times. And that's something that, you know, I think all creative people need to realize is that, like, you're not alone. And even the authors you look up to have felt that at times and continue to feel it probably um, because we all have people that we look up to. We all have writing that we look at and go, I could never write something like that. And that's what real writing is. And therefore, I am an imposter. Um, and I love the idea that Schmendrick is is some sort of exploration of that feeling. Um, I hadn't made that connection, but I, I really like it. At one point... Schmendrick throws out this insult, which I just had to quote because I thought it was so good. I forget who he's insulting. Maybe you can remember, but he says, I'll turn you into a bad poet with dreams. And <laughs> that's, as an author, I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> Not just a bad poet, but a bad poet with dreams. There's also this one line about being like nine tenths of an artist already, <laughs> but it's no good being nine tenths of an artist. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's worthless. <laughs> I continue to be sort of flummoxed by this Red Bull. It is, I guess it's just this mythical creature. And it's, I guess it's a reference to this, to this painting he saw as a kid, because I, I wasn't sure what it's, this bull is supposed to be. And it has this power over unicorns in particular, it seems. Um, It's quite dangerous. But then when she is transformed into a human and it doesn't recognize her anymore, it just leaves. Um, and and the, it has this nebulous relationship with Haggard where he, uh, Schmendrick even says like, oh, I've heard that, you know, he controls the bull, but then I've heard that the bull controls him. And I've heard that uh, the bull was there long before he arrived. And then I've heard that he brought the bull with him. And like, there's all these contradictions and a lot of that is never answered. So we're left with just this mystery of the relationship between the bull and Haggard how he ends up kind of controlling it, if he even does, or if they just work together in a weird way. Are they one in the same in some ways? Which it felt at times like they were kind of one in the same. Um, is it just a metaphor? 
I, I don't know. What, what, what is your take on the nature of the Red Bull? Do we know where the Red Bull maps on this whole concept of truth and illusion that goes through the story? Because every character, I think, apart from the cat mostly, mm. um, is an illusion somehow, is, is showing to the world another face or is misinterpreted when we first meet them. For example, Haggard is um, deemed a guard of his own right. castle when we first meet him. And yeah, everybody, almost everybody has a wrong face at the first point we meet them for some reason or an illusion or is even decepting the outer world. So where is the Red Bull? Because I can't really map him on this scale. If we follow that logic, I think the Red Bull can represent perhaps that um, the ignorance of the modern world and its inability to see magic because it specifically is like uh, an antagonist against unicorns who seem to represent everything that is sort of pure and wholesome and magical in the world. And it's blind, right? It can't see the beauty. It's blind. Yeah, that's a good point. It feels very metaphorical to me. Like this bull is, is a force that is negative in the world and it takes... Well, we'll get to it, but it takes the unicorn direct action from the unicorn to finally defeat it. It is it is highly metaphorical, but in fantasy that's okay. You can have you can have creatures that are just kind of manifestations of metaphor. I think that's fine. And especially for like a kid's book, like like kids don't question it. They're just like, All right, it's a big red bull. You know, like you're not even question it. Whereas like I'm trying to figure out what it means. <laughs> so the three continue to Haggard's castle, where Schmendrick introduces the unicorn as Lady Amalthea to throw off Haggard's suspicions. They convince Haggard to allow them to serve in his court. During their stay, Amalthea is romanced by Haggard's adopted son, Prince Lear. Haggard eventually reveals to Amalthea that the unicorns are trapped in the sea for his own benefit because the unicorns are the only things that make him happy. He then openly accuses Amalthea of coming to his kingdom to save the unicorns and says that he knows who she really is. But Almathea has seemingly forgotten about her true nature and her desire to save the other unicorns. Following clues given to them by a cat, Molly, Schmendrick, and Almathea find the entrance to the Red Bull's lair. They enter the Bull's lair and are joined by Lear. When the Red Bull attacks them, Schmendrick changes Almathea back to her original form. At this moment, Schmendrick joyfully becomes mortal. To save the unicorn, Lear jumps into the Bull's path and is trampled. Fueled by anger and sorrow, the unicorn drives the bull into the sea. The other unicorns are freed, and they run back to their homes, with Haggard's castle falling in their wake. As the castle falls, its wreckage dissolves into mist before it even hits the ground, and nothing remains to indicate that a castle had ever been. The unicorn revives Lear with the healing touch of her horn. Now king after Haggard's death, he attempts to follow the unicorn. As they pass through the now-ruined town of Hagsgate, they learn that Dryn is actually Lear's father, and that he abandoned the him in the marketplace. The unicorn returns to her forest. She then tells Schmendrick that she is different from all the other unicorns now, because she knows that what it is like to feel love and regret. Schmendrick and Molly later come across a princess in trouble, and he tells her to go to Lear because he is the hero to save her. Schmendrick and Molly leave this story into another as they sing a love song together. Okay, so that's the rest of the story all the way through the ending, but let's back up and kind of go through it chronologically. Um, we, we, we've got all of our players now. We've introduced a Haggard who's been someone who's been coming for a while in the story now. Um, and like you said, he shows up and he's mistaken as a guard. Um, but then he, he has this w court wizard that he dismisses because he's bored of him, basically. Um, and and he's like, yeah, you get out of here. I'm going to try this Smendrick out. He's clearly a bumbling fool who doesn't know any magic, but maybe that'll be amusing to me. And his whole attitude is one of depression to me, right? Like, he is he he seems clinically depressed. Like, nothing... His whole thing is he's trying to find joy. He's like, anywhere I can find joy, I'm looking for it. I try this thing out to see if it amuses me. It doesn't. He's uh, maybe this is part of the curse. I don't know, but he is just like sad all the time. Nothing amuses him. Nothing makes him makes him happy except for controlling and trapping these unicorns. Apparently, that's like the one thing that brings him joy. Um, so yeah, he's quite an interesting character, I guess. And and if you start looking at it metaphorically, like what could he represent? Um, well, you mentioned earlier the immortality 
side, like the possibility of an immortality side or what he could represent if he was. And, you know, just just the way that he's treating others. Yeah. And it seems he's so far above them. His station is so like untouchable in comparison. He's also a king. And then knowing that ultimately, like at the end of this, we see his castle turn to mist and how it's all an illusion and how it's all been created based on. Yeah. There was like a curse when he made the castle and it was all. Yeah, it is all tied to this magic. And and it, I think it is also notable that like his depression and his malice affects all the people who who are under him, like all of his um, all of the people who who he in his kingdom. Right. So his his pain is magically transmitted to just everything. And it makes like Hagstown a terrible place. And he yeah, he is someone who has seems to have no empathy and maybe isn't even recognizing the way that his own negativity um, is affecting everyone around him. There is a character that we need to talk about because the character's name is Lear. Yeah. And is a prince and would eventually go on to become a king mm-hmm. and King Lear. Um, and I wanted to know, like, what does that reinform the character for you at all? Like, do you think that this character would go on to have a similar story to King Lear from Shakespeare? Or is this just a, a wink and a nod to Shakespeare? Well, when I was uh, young and read the book, I didn't. It was just a fantasy name. Uh, now I read it differently, but I also read up on some background stuff. And so I think, was it some Celtic god or something? Okay. It's also called Lear. So oh, well. it's just some different influences, I think. Maybe accidental. I, th- I think I read that Beetle was aware of the of, of the um, King Lear, uh, what, what it would uh, suggest for the character. So Right. And, I, you know, it's been a long time since I read King Lear. I think I read it in high school. And... Yeah, I'm very bad at remembering the details of Shakespearean plays. Um, I just yeah. know it's a tragedy and things don't end well for Lear. <laughs> um, it seems like he's an unhappy figure. The most fascinating thing about Lear to me is his inability to connect with um, Amalthea, who is the human version of the unicorn, because he's he's this great hero and he can slay he slays five dragons and brings her the heads and he he's like going around and he's killing ogres and he's saving people and he's liberating places and it's all by the power of his sword and his strength it's very masculine it's very um traditional sword and sorcery type hero he's like conan or or one of these heroes that we read about and yet she doesn't care about it she's like i'm not interested in this um i feel bad for your horse who got burned when you describe well, that's the only thing she latches onto is like his horse got burned by a dragon. She's like goes to see the horse, um, which I, I thought was a cool subversion, right? Like none of this matters to her. She she's more interested in him when he gets into like poetry and starts talking about music and stuff like that. Like that's what she's interested in. She could care less about killing dragons. And in fact, it seems like she's like sad that he killed them. She even makes him sad. I think that's what it says when she looks at it she never talks to him in the beginning and he still feels sad about the dragon and yeah i think he's really deconstruction of this hero yeah role how does that speak to how does that speak to a young simone reading it i'm I'm curious is that something that you that you latched onto that you liked i found him a totally uh, boring character actually because i was not very much into love stories back then (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> so, so you d- you like... weren't interested in Lear as a as a romantic subplot. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> it is interesting how it does have that same trope, right, where it becomes sort of a romance at the end, and there's like a but but it subverts it, obviously. Yeah, definitely subverts it. But you're yeah, I mean, he's playing with that idea of a hero winning a princess's affection, right? That does not go. That is not how this really goes. Even though he kind of dances along that a little bit, but it's only when Lear changes like the ways in which he's trying to connect with her, that it even he even has any success. So I wanted to talk just briefly about this other magician, Mabrook, I think is how he says it. And uh, Mabrook gets cast out um, as, the, as the court magician in favor of Schmendrick. And I was convinced that Mabrook and the cat were one and the same. I was like, this cat is a transformed Mabrook who's like come in and is starting to like, drop these hints and trying to drive them towards the bull. And I, I thought there was going to be, it was nefarious. I wasn't trusting the cat at all. It was a talking cat. No one was doubting it. And I also had this weird relationship with the unicorn. Like it was distrustful of the unicorn or didn't want to come close to her. And I thought that was suspicious. 
so I had this note about how oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a reveal, and then it, it was never revealed that the cat was anything but a, a talking cat. Um, and Brooke never comes back to the story; um, it's just gone. And I don't know. I, it, it's like kind of it felt like a weird dangling thread to me. I was like, this character has to come back, but because he, he's warning him, he's like, you don't want to make an enemy of me, and then doesn't seem to have any effect. I think the interesting thing is that the cat at one time talks about uh, that humans are so much into appearances and a cat is not. So I yeah. think the cat is genuine in some way. It's just a cat. And it just also behaves cat. very <laughs> like a cat never gave somebody a clear answer. <laughs> <laughs> just a play on, on the nature of cats, which maybe is I why I was suspicious because I'm a dog person. <laughs> I do like cats. I do like cats. Um, but I'm just allergic to them. So I'm, I'm more of a dog person now. Um, okay, so we can we can leave the cat behind, but I was sure that was a that was an evil wizard in disguise. Like maybe all cats are. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's what Haggard was saying, right? That cats are just imposters and they are hiding demons or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then we get back to this mortality immortality thing, right? Like Schmendrick becomes mortal, seems to regain his power. He's able to transform the unicorn back. Uh, or yeah, the woman back into a unicorn, um, and then she only takes action against the bull when Lear sort of sacrifices himself and gets trampled. Um, what is this all saying about the themes of this of this book? I guess like how does this come together for an ending of a novel and a final confrontation? Hmm. So I thought uh, what I liked most about it is that really there are I don't know how many unicorns in this ocean that. Probably the Red Bull just collected one after the other and drove them into the ocean. And none of those had the idea once to turn around and confront him because that's all it takes. They don't need to fight or anything. They just need to make a stand, turn around, and the bull goes away. <laughs> and it never happened. Yeah, you're right. He says that the bull doesn't fight. He's like, oh, the bull doesn't fight. You just confront it and it flees. <laughs> so I think it needed that slice of mortality and the love story actually for the unicorn to make this decision and get get the idea in the first place. And that's super interesting. And, and there's something about like Schmendrick's magic being tied to him becoming um, mortal again. And then like when she's mortal, she can't see the unicorns and it takes her becoming a unicorn again before she can even perceive them. So there's almost this, this disconnect between mortality and mortality and being able to connect with magic. Um, and maybe you need to be able to walk in both worlds in some ways, because all the characters who are able to do it have been in both sides, right? Like you have the unicorn who has been mortal and you have the magician and Schmendrick who has been immortal and is now mortal again. And there's some of our like protagonist type characters who can really connect. One thing I actually, that reminds me to saying the word protagonist reminds me. The unicorn is our protagonist at the beginning of this book. We get her inner monologue. We get her observations of the world. And then as the novel progresses, she somehow starts to not be the protagonist anymore. And by the novel's end, it's like Schmendrick and Molly Grew and the humans. And we and she's this like she's distant now. We don't get her thoughts. She feels more like this disconnected mythical creature. Um, and I didn't even like realize it was happening. Like I felt like he, he was very subtly doing it over time. And it reminds me of that thinning thing you were saying, like the magic is leaving the novel. Um, and, by, and by the end, she's like a dream. Um, she, she, and maybe even not real. Um, really interestingly done. I had never seen that before. Like an author's like protagonist slowly and like almost subtly and almost outside of my perception, not being the protagonist anymore. I don't, I don't even know how he did that. It was pretty amazing when I when I realized it. I was like, oh, where's where's our you know our our inner thoughts of the of the unicorn because we we've lost them. We get none of them by the end. When she became Lady Amalthea, uh, she's forgetting about being a unicorn. So I think like that's an that's an easy way to to like sort of start to linger and go away from that perspective. So the transformation of the character would equal the transformation of the POV actually. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think those those two do kind of line up. Um, so I want to ask you about Molly Grew as a character because she, um, for me, one thing that she did was she helped with the unfortunate connotation of making like a woman out to be a mythical creature that has to be pleased. And like, there's a lot of this going on and it helps that Molly Grew is also a woman. She's the only other like major woman character we get other than Fortuna, who's this like witch. Um, 
who uh who does anything really in the book um and she also is you know cares about the the unicorn she's able to actually be like touch the unicorn in a way that um Schmendrick is not at least at first i was i was super glad especially when i read it this time that molly was in this novel because otherwise i would have had a problem with the um female characters yeah. really because the unicorn is something <laughs> Uh, and the others are mostly these princesses and they are not depicted in a very good light mostly right yeah the princesses are are just to be won by heroes it feels like like they're yeah they're part of these fairy tales that i I have a quote here where he says haven't you been in a fairy tale before (laughs) and i'm like wait what (laughs) um and he, he like recognizes we're in a fairy tale this is how these things go and whenever something bad happens it's like yeah that had to happen because we're in a fairy tale and like bad stuff has to happen to the hero and um you know princesses i guess have to be saved and like things like that and the unicorn subverts that in some ways but in other ways is still this mythological woman that the men are all pining after and she's so beautiful and they want her affection um and yeah molly grew is the only character that that sort of subverts that i do think it's notable too like we talked about the that she it seems like no one else will touch the unicorn and she like every chance she gets touches the unicorn um and like what that's saying about her character i'm not sure but you know no one else is doing this but she is that her personality or is that the author saying saying something i think it it uh, ties into the reality and illusion thing because if you touch something you make it somehow more real to yourself and to the world and there are so many facades in this book and Molly is one of the few characters who doesn't have one I think Mm -hmm. and she is very grounded I think she is anchoring us in in reality in this fairy tale because she's from the beginning she is introduced as a decidedly non-fairy tale character when she says to to the unicorn why do you come to me now she complains about this because she has dropped out of the fairy tale. She has fallen in with this bandit captain and it's not the life she was <laughs> yeah. envisioning it to be. And I think her fairy tale is over for her. So funny too, how that those bandits like think themselves and sing songs about how they're just like Robin Hood. But the, the bandits are like, we're not like Robin Hood. You realize that, right? Like we don't rob from the rich yeah. and give to the poor. We don't do any of that. <laughs> Final confrontation t- occurs, and the, uh, the the unicorns come out of the sea, destroy the castle. Haggard falls and is killed, and then Prince Lear becomes King Lear, resurrected by the unicorn's horn touch, which is like one of the first times, I think the first time she's ever touched him. And then she touches him again. Um, one one resurrects him, and one does something else. And I forget, what, what does the second touch do? I, I think it's just for the touch's sake, because the first one was the reviving and then it's just because she wants to touch him i guess yeah i think you're right yeah it's like the second touch was just for him and like uh, um there's some interesting correlation between schmendrick and lear to me like they at times they felt like they had very similar attitudes towards her and i kept thinking that schmendrick i don't know maybe his love for her for the the unicorn was not romantic in the way that lear's seems to be but they're the way that they both love the unicorn and like um, recognize her and and sort of cherish her uh, mythicality, her 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 what her essence as a unicorn, and and Lear says like you have to become a unicorn again, um, and Schmendrick seems to also recognize the value in that, um, but both of them are also unable to touch her, and uh, yeah, she she just has. You just I don't know interesting attitudes towards them. I, I guess I'm I'm trying to unpack it in my head still, and this is part of the sort of enigma that this book pre- presents to me is trying to figure out what what is really going on here and why these relationships are what they are. And so much of it I think is 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 in this metaphor and this th- these themes, but also like even just the the te- as the text is read, why is the unicorn feel this way about both of them? Because it seems like she likes them, but also is keeping them at arm's length. It's only when she forgets who she is and becomes a sort of mortal woman that she is even able to uh, love Lear. And then she says, if you turn me back into a unicorn, I won't love you anymore. I think that has mostly to do with just the nature of immortality, right? Like we talked about that, how it will shift your perspective to where you can't live in the in the present. You don't live as passionately through your life. It's more, it's more removed. Mm. 
I also think she doesn't want to touch things because she doesn't want to get attached to things. She doesn't want to love someone. She doesn't want to regret having loved someone. She's even not able to. And I think that getting close to someone is dangerous, makes you vulnerable. And she can't have that in her immortal life because it's so much deeper and longer. And, but it also, it's not, as, it, it's, it's both that, but then also there is a sense that she is unable to do that. Something about being immortal is like a is like a block, and she's able to do it a little bit because she talks about how she has experienced love and regret. But like she can't love him in the way that she could as a human. It's impossible for her now, um, not just because she's a unicorn, but but because of her immortality and her, the nature of her being and her ongoing story, she can't love something who has a someone who has a finite story. They're just like on two different levels, and and. Maybe that's talking about the nature of magic and reality and how the two are somewhat incompatible. Um, and, and maybe the little ways that they overlap with each other is like where the story takes place and where, where fantasy fiction is for all of us. You know, I, I like that as a, as a reading of this book. Okay, so um, we get the final part here where we get Dren, who uh, is, is revealed to be his actual father. And he seems to come forward like, oh, now that you're king, hey, I'm your dad. And, uh, you know, you owe me. <laughs> um, and and at first he wants to just cast him and be like, no, nah. he just turns around to walk away. But Schmendrick tells him like, hey, you're king now. You have to you have to like rule your people even if you don't like them. He also doesn't like Hagstown. Like he doesn't want to deal with the people of Hagstown. But Schmendrick kind of reminds him that he has a duty to them now. All he wants to do is go chase the unicorn. Um, like that's all he cares about, but he's like, you can't do that. You have to be king and you have to be, you know, you have to help these people. They need you now. Um, and I think that's kind of where his journey goes, right? Like he chases after the unicorn for a while, but eventually has to give up. It's Schmendrick and Molly who have the dream of the unicorn. And, um, he demands, he's like, tell me what she said to you. And Molly's like, I'll never tell you. <laughs> and also never tells us, which I thought was interesting. I really wanted to know what Molly's dream was. Um, but we get a bit of Schmendrick's dream. Um, and we, you know, this is where we learn that, that she has, uh, the, the, the unicorn has experienced regret and love. Um, but again, it's like such a remove, right? Like it's the unicorn isn't even physically present. It's just through this dream. Um, and it, that thinning is continuing here. Um, and then the king just like sadly leaves and um, then this princess shows up and uh, uh, Schmendrick is like she runs up and she's like oh you know my father is terrible and he was my father was killed by by my uncle uh, uncle wolf or something and it's a very like clear setup for a you know a traditional style adventure and he's like that's great, but you got the wrong guy. The guy you want just left on his horse <laughs> that way and, and puts her on a horse and sends her after, which is definitely funny. Um, but also I think speaks to the idea that like my reading of Lear is that he is this traditional fantasy hero who pines for the unicorn, but ultimately like that is not his lot in life. Like he is, he's still ultimately trapped by the nature of his existence and like, what he's good at is saving someone like her and, and like that's his role and being a good king. And like he's trapped sort of in the story that he is has been telling um, and he can't he can't have the unicorn and he can't be with the unicorn in the way that he wants to be. Um, I don't know. It's like it, it, in a sense, it's like it's very thematic, but it's also getting into like storytelling meta stuff. Right. Like a little bit like he's trapped in a story. They leave this story and go into another I think it says at the end of the book, which is very meta. Um, so, so yeah, what final thoughts, I guess, on the end of this novel? In a similar way to, you know, that like following action where in a fantasy story you have like some time you, you, you sort of return to the status quo. You have people, some people in a better position, like you have King Lear, hopefully being a better king than, than Haggard. And um, yeah, the unicorn. It's I, I like that the story took the took the time to be sort of bittersweet. Like, oh, the adventure is completed, um, characters have grown, but at the end of the day, like the happy ending isn't necessarily where we end up here. And I think that makes for a, a um, especially for the '60s and like what the story I think represents. Like that makes for a good, unique sort of sort of ending. And, and like with the nature of this unicorn, understanding that she has felt grief and loss 
she still can't really engage with it. And like that, you know, going forward, we know that she'll be different, but she'll kind of go back to how she was living before. Mm. And is that, does that, is that like a theme that like readers could take with them in some way? Like what, what can we take away from that? Yeah, I'm not sure I, because I think that's wrapped up in the nature of immortality. Like I think that that's maybe letting the reader think about their mortality and what it means to be alive and what it means to feel these emotions and go through these mm. experiences in the way that we can maybe apply them after the fact and where, where I feel like this unicorn might not. Well, you, you were talking about how people all want to like think they want to be immortal and the, some of the inherent difficulties with that. And so I think maybe this, if you start thinking about it as like our, our relationship with death and, and um, our own mortality, um, maybe we are trapped in our own stories, right? Like we can't, we can't escape the nature of our stories. And so we can't have that immortality as much as we might want it. Um, Simone, right. what, what were your final thoughts on the end of the novel here? What were your takeaways? Mm, I too like the bittersweet ending. Um, and I, for me, it's, Especially with the songs, uh, it ends with a song yeah. and uh, hints at other stories that might happen. I think even for the unicorn, it's not really final. They say they just hope she goes back to their to her um, old life, but maybe she can't. Maybe she will become a wanderer, and she, they say that's a human thing. That's not a unicorn thing, actually. I like that, yeah, because it's like, what if she does go back to her her old life and realizes it's not enough for her anymore, having having you know learned what the there's other some hints that that may be the case i think she even says that yeah. says as much yeah so yeah i think what i take away is that it's talking a lot also about fictionalizing things storifying things because we all know the characters know we're in a fairy tale and nothing ever ends the next fairy tale comes up and this is somehow the real magic we have here um that things get immortalized in tales you know that's the kind mm. of immortality it's also talking about, like Im being immortalized in memories, in in ongoing tales and so on. That's a better take. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and, and going from one story to another, uh, like I, that that ties into what you're saying. Like this is an eternal story, and and I think it's not just Beagle stories, right? Like he's not just saying that they leave to another story that he's going to write one day. It's like another story is someone else is going to tell like this is this is there's something eternal about these characters um even if we don't necessarily recognize that i think he's claiming like nope Smendrick, molly the unicorn like these are eternal characters they just take different forms in other in other stories um and and that's how they they do live on and achieve that immortality uh yeah i like that a lot and uh, i am so curious to see how this is going to be adapted into a movie animated movie so I, i'm sure that there's gonna be um they're able to achieve that fantasy nature and i've seen you know some rankin bass i've seen the hobbit that they did which um i james i'm gonna make you watch as a, as a bonus episode at least when we do cover the hobbit later this year fingers crossed um because i love that version of the hobbit and it'll be interesting watching this i think and then going to that uh, and we'll be able to compare the two we we also covered rudolph the red nosed reindeer was Rankin Bass and also the Return of the King, that right? We, which that was bad. <laughs> we did not like the Return of the King. Um, it is unfortunate, and I, I'm, I was when I when we got done watching it, I was worried. I'm like, I hope this doesn't ruin Rankin Bass for for James because I think The Hobbit is a much superior version of what they're able to do. Um, and I know people love this is a cult classic movie. We're gonna get to. We're gonna talk about it next week, and I'm excited to say that uh, the plan, at least, is for Simone to join us again for the movie which should be a ton of fun to talk about. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Simone, uh, if people wanted to read your work and, uh, you know, f keep up with your writing, where can they find you online so that they can do that? Um, I've got a web page that's just missnavigator.com in one word. And that's M-I-S-S. -S. Missnavigator.com. Yeah. Yeah. And on Twitter, I'm her lizardness, also one word <laughs> <laughs> cool um and do you have anything coming out that you you can point people towards yeah actually i do so there is um, an anthology with a story of mine in it it's about um, alien life forms and it's accompanied by essays with each story written by scientists it's called life beyond us and will be out later this year what kind of alien life form are you are you writing about can i ask a tree a tree an alien tree that's awesome <laughs> perfect <laughs> 
Uh, okay, so that we're so glad that we were able to have you on, and I'm so excited that you're going to be back next week. So uh, make sure to check us out next week when we when we tackle the movie. Uh, this has been a delight. Thank you, Simone. Thank you. So if you enjoyed this episode, please let us know in the form of a rating and review on whatever app you chose to listen on. If you liked us talking about The Last Unicorn in in-depth ways, um, mention that in the review, and we'd love to hear that from you. Give us five stars. Uh, that would be awesome. And if you'd like to support the podcast in another way, consider checking out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash ink to film. We have many different tiers, but for just $2 a month, you get our bonus content. And we do adaptation adjacent things usually, but sometimes we experiment on there. We just had an episode where we where we kind of went through and did it. I did a Q&A with you, Luke, about your, about your story. They come from the void. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. And um, I think people who are interested in our work like will really enjoy that episode. Well, we also... Uh, spitballed ideas for an adaptation, which is very appropriate for this podcast, I think, and talked about like how we would tackle certain scenes and stuff. So it was fun. I'd love it if people check that out. Also, if you would like to connect with us on social media, we are at ink to film on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Oh, also on TikTok. I made a new TikTok for our podcast. I think I have a few uploads on there. I'm experimenting, trying different things with like a little like short videos. So I'd love for you to follow us on there at ink to film on TikTok. And thank you to Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. All right. We'll be back next week to tackle this animated film. Uh, Simone should be returning if, as long as we can get our time zones worked out. Nine hours ahead uh, of me, at least, um, out yeah. here. In the, so it's a little tricky, but we've been getting it to work. Um, and, and it's been a lot of fun having her on. So hopefully you'll join us again for that. And until next time, keep adapting. Keep adapting.